This is David Duval. My guest today is the American pianist Stanley Waldorf. Stanley was raised in Mississippi and has played the length and breadth of this nation since childhood. Stan, we have known each other many years, and it's always been a great pleasure for me to not only hear you play, but actually play in concerts with you because we have, oh, I would say played in 40 states in America, our various programs where we uh, talk and we play the piano. How have you been? And I'm glad to know you're in New York these days. Well, I've been well, and of course, I've I've enjoyed very much all the contact that we've had over these years. I've enjoyed our lecture recitals, which I've always found very interesting, and I've enjoyed uh, recordings that we've made together. Yes, we've had a good time, so to speak, and uh, we, I think, have never lost interest in the piano literature. Uh, we're always speaking about a new piece we've discovered or something like that. Yes, well, I think we're, we're really have gone beyond the basic literature, yeah. as uh, maybe we'll find out a little bit today. We've... Uh, gone into literature which most people have either forgotten about or have never thought about and I think you once termed it exhuming ghosts. Yes and some of these ghosts should certainly be heard more than they are and uh, we would try our best as they say. Yes I, I think generally though when we've picked these oddities of the literature that we've always tried to pick those that we felt were were actually very good pieces and could stand on their own. Oh well, and, and they do no doubt about it and we'll hear from your recordings, three of them indeed, uh, of romantic pianist composers and uh, from the volume of American composers. Uh, but first, I want to have our audience know a little bit more about Stanley Waldorf. I know that your mother was raised in Odessa. I would say that's like a hotbed of pianists, right? They were just, almost everyone born seemed to play the piano then. Yes, uh, Beveridge Webster once told me that if you were Russian and Jewish, you, you never had to practice. <laughs> I, I don't know that that's true. Uh, obviously, it's not in my case, but I think it's a very f wonderful line, and I think it's certainly applicable to the many, many great Russian Jewish pianists that we have. How did it happen, do you think? Have you ever thought of that, that at that period of time when your mother was born and, and before, that that area from Odessa to Kiev, so to speak, produced Horowitz, Simon Barrer, and on and on? Uh, I really don't know. I think there was, of course, that cultural climate in Russia which helped produce these people, plus the exceptional schooling which they had. By the way, my understanding is, is that the only thing they've kept after the revolution is the superb schooling which was prevalent before 1917. Well, you were in Russia yourself in the last uh, five or six years. Yes. Well, actually, 1976. How was it? Was uh, it fun? It was interesting. I, I don't know that the word fun <laughs> is applicable. It was certainly interesting, and I got a chance to see some family um, whom I had never seen before, and that was very fascinating. Of course, it's a beautiful country. I, I don't want to get into the system because mm -hmm. that would be a whole other show. Yes. Well, uh, I know that uh, when you came back to New York, you said, oh, it's so good to be back because things certainly are easier here. Yes, I said that. I remember uh, saying to you, I said, let's go eat because I had not had very good food there. Everyone yeah. complains of the same thing. Were you in Leningrad? Yes, I was in Leningrad. I was in Odessa. I was in Kiev and in Moscow. Wonderful. Stan, you were raised in Mississippi. You uh, played your first concerts there. Your mother was your first teacher, as happens with many uh, expert pianists. And then something interesting happened to you in probably your teen years. You traveled every week to a most unusual man, the Hungarian pianist Istvan Nadaj, who was living in New Orleans. Tell me something of him, because I admire him very much. Yes, it, it was a wonderful experience in my life. Uh, from the age of about 12 or 13 uh, t uh, till I graduated high school, maybe it was a little later, actually. It could have been 14. It's It's very hard to place these times. Uh, I went down to New Orleans, as you said, once a week to study with this wonderful man who, in a sense, gave me a sense of what the literature was about and what a pianist should be about. I don't know that I ever met those kind of criterion because he's certainly a giant and a giant in terms of, of playing everything. Uh, that's not my thing in, in, in terms of the piano. But he, he gave me a sense of what what the piano should be about, what your feelings about music should be. And I've been forever grateful for that kind of guidance. He, Liszt uh, once said about Czerny, uh, he gave me the most important thing, 
he gave me discipline. Mm. And so that with Istvan, I can truly say uh, he gave me discipline. Well, I've always admired that discipline in you. And as you were uh, developing in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, you were up very early in the morning, as uh, you would say, so your fingers wouldn't be spaghetti fingers because <laughs> that's, not that's I right. said – you must practice your crime or your your uh, and, and yet you also had a, had a childhood full of sports. You were a very good baseball player, things like that. So, well, I I, I did practice um, not as much as I should have. Mm. I I think everybody <laughs> says that, but I certainly got up very early in the morning and I I practiced scales and all those sorts of things. And then, oddly enough, stopped doing that when I was seventeen. I shouldn't really say that, but it but it's true. Well, uh, most people do say that, Stan. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> My guest today is. Stanley Waldorf, and we're going to be hearing seven pieces from three recordings that he brought with him. And we're going to begin, Stan, with, uh, well, we said that we uh, exhumed the ghosts, that we like doing that. And you have a performance of At the Spring by a man by the name of Raphael Yosefi. Who was he? Well, he was uh, one of the giants of the 19th century, a, a great pianist. And obviously people have seen that he's, that he's made many uh, he was the editor of many, many, uh, uh, much music of the 19th century. Chopin editions. Absolutely. I, I'm not fond of his editions, but I am fond of this piece. It's one of the really fun pieces that I've ever played and horrendously difficult. Well, we're going to hear it. Stanley Waldorf, my guest today, in Raphael Josephi's At the Spring. At the Spring, a piano piece by Raphael Josefi, my guest, Stanley Waldorf. Right after this message, we'll return with more discussion about pianists, about Waldorf's career, and another piece by Talberg. This is David Dubal, my guest today, Stanley Waldorf, not only a fantastic pianist, and we have just heard that kind of virtuosity which comes from the great discipline we were speaking of that Istvan Nadaj gave you as a child in New Orleans as you were literally taking the bus from Hattiesburg to New Orleans every week. I can picture you now, you know, 
hoping that you would have a good lesson because, of course, he was a temperamental man. Yeah, a, a holy terror. Really. Well, what he gave you was incalculable. Uh, Stan, you have been recording for Musical Heritage for the last few years, and you've put um, on record at least 25, 26 different composers. And I know that you have a great deal of fun finding the music. Talberg is a composer that um, I think we were both excited when we uh, read through this piece and that you learned it's called The Departure, and it's an etude in a form of variations. Tell me about Talberg, because we have a lot of music to get on, and I'd love to know about this composer. Well, j just briefly, I will say that we found this m music in the Lincoln Center Special Collections, and we happened to pull out a bunch of things, and you and I looked at this and said, oh, this looks like a great piece. And I think we were ro absolutely right. Talberg was a man who was probably Liszt's only rival as a performing pianist. He was born in 1812. He died in 1871. He uh, retired, oddly enough, from the piano in 1864, I believe it was. You know better than I, because you always remember all dates. And but you're very good at this, too. <laughs> and he, That's because I've been with you a long time. <laughs> and he uh, bought a farm. He gave up composing. He gave up piano playing. And when asked why he didn't at least compose anymore, he said, my imitators have made it impossible for me. He was really the inventor of that three-handed effect which Liszt loved to use in his works. Absolutely, and a full-blown romantic. Well, Although a classical player, as a matter of fact, I just should say briefly that people as serious as Mendelssohn considered him a better pianist than Liszt. Yes, many did, and of course we know none of his music now, and we will see that this is like Oh, a very grand, almost uh, Victorian canvas. Uh, a little bit of arsenic and old lace, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And pianistically, the layout is just a dream. Wonderful piece. Stanley Waldorf is now going to play The Departure by Sigismund Thalberg. <laughs>
What a gorgeous work, Sigismund Thalberg. Tell me the title. Uh, it's the etude in form of variations titled Le Départ. Le Départ. Stanley Waldorf, my guest today. I will be right back with more discussion and more music right after this message. The American-born pianist Stanley Waldorf is my guest today, and we have known each other for many years. We have talked music, uh, and we have played in 40 states together. We just heard the departure of Talberg, and we're going to go to a Levitsky work. Who is Levitsky? We'll find out in a minute. But first, let's continue with your career. After Juilliard, and you studied there with all oh, important teachers, including Martin Cannon, right? Right. Um, um, Marty uh, has been a dear friend of, of mine for a number of years and someone whom I trust musically and will, of course, go to play for when I have things to play, just to make sure that I'm doing what I think I'm doing yes. and sometimes doing what I shouldn't be doing. You've always been a believer in playing for the people that you think have great ears. Absolutely. Uh, although I, I think I've said to you that the greatest invention since the piano for pianists is the tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And I use that almost all the time when I, when I practice. I still think that you need someone else, at least one other person, to listen because I think that sometimes the ego gets in the way and you really imagine what you're hearing and you may not indeed be doing it. Yes. So I've, I've relied very heavily on, on Marty Cannon for a number of years. Um, we spoke before of the discipline you got in childhood. John Browning was here recently, and he was saying that um, people aren't practicing enough uh, things like uh, double thirds and so forth. Are you an advocate of um, that early childhood severe training? Well, I I'm of the opinion that it must be done in early childhood. I don't think that one can do anything beyond the age of 17 or 18 in terms of developing a, a prodigious technique. Uh, the muscles are set. Uh, it all has to be done in childhood. You can't make pianists late. As a matter of fact, I mean, you know more about this than I do. The only pianist I can think of that had a major career as a late bloomer, a really late bloomer, would be Paderewski, and mm -hmm. he was never considered a giant pianist. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying that one can't play the piano well. That is not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying in the major leagues, it can't be done. I understand that. So the, the most important years are probably from around uh, 7 to 13, would you say? Yeah, or at least till 15. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I might spread it out a little bit more. And I think it all has to be done then. I, certainly, refinement can be done mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later. But. Are you a, an advocate of learning a great deal of literature? Absolutely. I mean, I think that all has to be done also in childhood. And then I think that basically you have to navigate to that literature with which you have empathy mm -hmm. when you're... Uh, <laughs> when you're older. Learn it all then absolutely. and then find out what's for your temperament. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you think in this country or anywhere many um, young people are forced into playing the piano? They have so many things to do these days from skating to, to uh, lessons of all kind that sometimes I, I, I see the schedule of a young child and I say, how can they do it? Well, they are. I, I, you know, I don't really see anything wrong with that. Uh, I do, if it's, if they continue to be force-fed as they get older. But I certainly don't see anything wrong with learning to play the piano as part of your basic education. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to that at it's all. It's rather nice, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, if one can learn about football, one can certainly learn about mm -hmm. piano playing. I mm -hmm. think. Yes. Uh, let's talk about you as the educator. You uh, have been teaching at the University of Southern Mississippi for several years, and uh, you enjoy it immensely. Yeah, I've been there for 13 years. I, it, it's an interesting experience teaching uh, and teaching in a university situation. We are, I feel, a, an excellent music education school, uh, and I think that's a very valuable thing. People sneer at it uh, in, in the urban areas sometimes as well, you know, this and this in terms of, you know, is it applied, is it this? Yeah, we have some of that, but basically we're a music education school and a very, very good one. We have a large school with a large faculty. We have a, a president, uh, Aubrey Lucas, who uh, is a man who's been very dedicated to the uh, performing arts and who, uh, along with uh, other people at the university, uh, has um, maintain a quest for excellence. They have been very good to me. They've been very supportive, and I have, of course, have been grateful and am grateful to them. 
Um, well, I think it's important for a university to be supportive of their performing musicians because they have to be able to leave and they have to be able to feel good about uh, teaching. And I know that you... Yes, and, and to be... In, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but to be encouraged. And I've been there for 13 years, and they have always encouraged me to do. This is the University of Southern Mississippi, by the way. I Didn't I say that? <laughs> yes, I just make sure because sometimes people think it's the University of Mississippi, and that's a different school. Oh, this is the University of it's, Southern Mississippi. It's in Hattiesburg. At Hattiesburg, right. Mississippi, right. and I remember very well when we played our program, right. the Piano in America, the wonderful facilities and a tremendous audience we had there. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk now about the composer pianist who you'll be uh, playing for us in a second or two. His name, Misha Levitsky. Tell us about this piece. Well, well actually, I'm, I'm, I always enjoy hearing you talk about them more than I do myself. He was a famous pianist uh, in, in the golden age of pianism in the 20th century, the early 20th century. And he died, I believe, am I correct, at 42 or something yes, like that? Yes, yeah. Uh, see, I have learned some things from you. Hmm. And uh, this is an arabesque uh, valsant, a very bittersweet piece with the most gorgeous melodies and the most gorgeous motion and I just was crazy about this piece. It's and it's on Music of the Romantic Pianist Composer uh, Musical Heritage. Uh, uh, volume two of right. that, by the way. It's and I want to give the number because it's forty two forty six. Yes, MHS 4246. You can also get it on cassette. And I want to say that uh, I have a feeling our audience will be calling in about this piece because it is right out of the Cafe Budapest, so to speak. Absolutely. You feel you're in uh, pre-World War II Budapest yes. sitting in the cafes. Let's hear Stanley Waldorf in Misha Levitsky's Arabesque Valsant. <laughs> Bravo, Stanley Waldorf's performance of the arabesque Valsant by Misha Levitsky, a pianist of the Golden Age. Stanley Waldorf, my guest today, and we're listening to 
some of his discography, and we've heard Levitsky, and uh, wow, it's so interesting to be using the word Levitsky because this is about the only thing that he is uh, that's on record of his, I believe, and maybe another waltz. Um, the next composer, though, is not going to be a pianist of the 19th century, but we're going to go back to our American program, the record we made on musical heritage. I did one side of it, and you did another side of it, and we've had more fun on those lecture recitals called The Piano in America, where it's like a sociological history. Do you remember anything offhand? I know we haven't discussed this, but right this minute that was extremely interesting about many of the places we played. Well, I, I I remember Flint, Michigan, because we played two packed houses two nights in a row with 2,000 people each night, and I was stunned, as you were, when we walked on stage and all of these people out there. I mean, you expect that maybe you'll see two or 300. Well, but, the storm was unreal. It was know. one of the biggest snowstorms I had ever right. seen in my life, and I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, so you can imagine what that means. Yes, this is good. what did Khrushchev say? He said Cleveland, Ohio was... Uh, uh, just like Moscow. Just like Moscow. Yeah. Um, and then we were caught once in a snowstorm, a deadly snowstorm in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. where we were in a motel room for four days eating mushroom soup. I ne I'll never forget it. Never forget it. Uh, so there's so many interesting things that happen when you're touring. Do you remember the, um, the, the uh, what was it, ice that fell through the roof during the in, in another city during a piece I was playing? Yes, yes, yes. And I, I do recall that. And I, I remember jumping I'm 20 feet because obviously when you're concentrating, it sounds like you're being assassinated. Remind me of the old Sid Caesar show of shows when he was playing the Greek concerto, and if he got to a spot, he would be killed, so he kept avoiding it. <laughs> Stanley, who are the pianists that have made an indelible mark on you? I know, of course, Rubinstein has been an inspiration. Rubinstein is probably, in my life, of the pianists I've heard live, uh, my favorite. Uh, he, someone once said uh, uh, that they've never failed to learn something when they I've gone to a Rubenstein concert. I, I think that's true. For me, it's always come alive. Every time I've, I've heard him, I've, I've just been overwhelmed by the sheer uh, musicality and the kind of nobility uh, and, and elegance that he brought to everything he played. Truly a great man. Of the pianists that I have not heard live, I mean, of course, there are the Hoffmans and the Courteau, who was just one of my favorites. Well, I remember once you, you, you zoomed across the street one day, you saw me and you said, David, you almost got hit by three or four cars. You said, <laughs> I have never, I've never heard Courteau's waltzes before. I, I am in heaven. Please, we have to hear these this minute. We went in and uh, I think that you practically fainted at the end of each one. Yeah, that was many years ago, but that's absolutely true. And then, of course, we later, we subsequently heard the etudes. Mm -hmm. And uh, although people might say, pianists might say, well, they're a little sloppy, that's true, but musically, in, in terms of the internal clock, they're absolutely perfect, they're the best. Yeah, the internal clock, that's an interesting phrase. Now, obviously one of the dominant forces in, in world pianism has been Horowitz. Oh, yeah. Have you always been a fan? Yeah, I'm afraid I have to say that. I mean, it, it's, it's like, it's, it's easy to say, no, I don't like him because of this and this and this. And you can't say that. He's, he's an absolute genius. Uh, the, what he sees in the music is just phenomenal. I remember having gone to Carnegie Hall and heard another great pianist, I don't think I should mention the name, uh, and play the Scriabin Fifth Sonata. And I thought, this is the most incredible performance I have ever heard. I, I almost jumped off the balcony. Mm -hmm. And then some years uh, later, I heard Horowitz play the Scriabin Fifth Sonata, and he made the other man sound like a child. I mean, he absolutely revealed things that I had never heard and you know, never hoped to hear again. And isn't this really the interpretive art at its best when oh, someone it's, can reveal a, a new aspect of the it, score? It's, it almost goes beyond recreativity. Mm -hmm. It becomes actually the creative process. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I adore everything he does. I don't, but I certainly recognize him for the miracle that he is. You have been recording for Musical Heritage Society for a long time, and you have just completed a waltz album, and one of those pieces is by Rachmaninoff, a transcription of Chrysler's music. Right, another great pianist, and obviously somebody that I truly adore and have grown to adore more and more as time has gone on. I, I found him a little cool in the early years, and now really have grown to just absolutely adore that kind of piano playing. Uh, of the contemporary pianists, those people alive today, I, I like so many people. Uh, 
I often say I'm, I'm, I'm a musical prostitute because I really like so many people for various and sundry reasons. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are those that you know I find special for one reason or another and those that I admire personally because I know them. That's, that's another subject of discussion, too. We're going to hear a composer very little known, and yet, as we'll hear soon, so charming. His name, Alexander Reinagel. Who was he? Uh, he was a revolutionary uh, composer. I believe he lived in the city of Philadelphia, and that he presented uh, a musical evenings, was a friend of George Washington, and all that sort of thing. And uh, he wrote uh, pieces, uh, and this is a sonata. I believe we're going to hear the last movement from this. Yes, you're recording an MHS of the American composers. It's 3808, and it's three minutes long. Stanley Waldorf will play the last movement of the E Major Sonata by Alexander Reinagel. E Major Sonata Alexander Reinagel. After this message, we will continue this program of the art of Stanley Waldorf, and we will listen to a work by Czerny. This is David Dubal, my guest today, the American pianist Stanley Waldorf. Stanley is in town to discuss various projects, and I would like to ask you a question which is really quite interesting. We don't get a very many people to ever talk about a record company, and this is by no means a plug, but we have had such a good relationship with a record company, and uh, these are people at Musical Heritage Society who appreciate the idea of a well-programmed album. Yeah, I, I don't see anything even wrong with giving them a plug. I think mm -hmm. they're a very unusual company in the sense that they are willing to do literature which the major companies probably wouldn't do because they might be afraid that 
there wouldn't be enough sales. Of course, the interesting thing is, Dan, is that Musical Heritage Society really is a major company now, a real right. force. I, yeah, I'm going to have to correct that. I don't <laughs> want anyone mad at me. They are a real force. And what I mean, I meant the more uh, traditional companies such as Columbia and RCA and those people. And they're wonderful companies, too. I don't want to get on anyone's case. All I want to say is, is that Musical Heritage, uh, uh, together with doing the standard literature, also is willing to do the kind of literature that that possibly uh, uh, people find interesting even if they don't know it. And I, I think they're one of the valuable additions and to this whole industry of recorded music because enough is enough. Uh, the 28,000th uh, performance of the Beethoven Third Symphony is fine, but I mean, maybe it's nice occasionally to hear Levitsky or Josephi of the, or those people, and for that they should be highly commended. Oh, absolutely. And even more so is that they can get excited about repertory for a record. Yes, and they recognize uh, 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 good programming, yes. <laughs> as we have done for them. Yeah, and I think our records are indeed good programs. Uh, often we uh, combine the recordings, the music on the recordings, with a script, and we discuss wherever it be, if it be in uh, California or Montana or Illinois, and people very much like to hear about the composers. Yeah, everyone. As well. I'm sorry. Everyone is interested in high gossip, yeah. including myself. Yeah. By the way, it's it's one of the few things left that really interests me in music history. Well, we're going to play a work by Cherney, and we can give a little gossip about him right now. Yeah, Cherney was uh, um, uh, uh, obviously the teacher of Liszt at least for two or three years. Am I correct yes. in that? Uh, and uh, uh, pupil of Beethoven, and uh, he wrote sets of etudes for the piano. People think that he hated children because of that. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's, that's very true. Uh, and uh, he, he was a marvelous man. I think he, he bequeathed all his money to a school for the deaf when he died. Yes. He had no family. He had 20 or 30 cats. He had many stands, which he would fill with music paper, and he'd be in the process of seven or eight works at a time. And uh, he was uh, someone that never married, never had a personal life. He was teaching every day for 12, 14 hours. He was just absolutely amazing that way. Yes, he was a, a, a real workaholic. This is a piece, by the way, that the great Russian pianist Joseph Levine made famous. He used it as an encore, and it is a very taxing, very difficult to play all those octaves well, correct. It's very difficult. Uh, I used to say jokingly that, that heavy octaves or loud octaves were, were not so hard, and uh, the the really difficult octave playing was the light octaves, and this mm -hmm. piece is certainly a, a study in that. Every student really should be studying this A-flat etude in, in light octaves. And let me tell you, if I have never told you before, this is a performance that goes beyond Joseph Levine's. Stan, I, you're embarrassed, but this is the truth. I am embarrassed, and I, but I do appreciate it. If it's just half as good as his, I would be very pleased. Let's hear it. It's only a minute and 33 seconds of taxing light wrist octaves. Stanley Waldoff, the artist. <laughs> Thank you. 
glorious octave etude by Carl Cherney of Exercise fame. Well, this is not exactly for the beginner, uh, that work. Stanley Waldorf, my guest, was the pianist, and it can be heard on Volume 1 of the Music of the Romantic Pianist Composer, Musical Heritage Society, 3681. Now, I remember when that record came out, it also later on came out in cassette, and I called Stanley Waldorf up in Mississippi, and I said, do you know that your recording of uh, Cherney and Gottschalk, so forth, just came out on cassette, and he said, Oh, David, that is wonderful. What's a cassette? <laughs> well, that was, that was in the early days, of, <laughs> for me, of cassette, uh, of cassette use. So yeah. I believe you told that story to Horowitz when you interviewed him. Yes, I did. And he laughed also? Yes, because you see... Uh, he didn't understand it He didn't it know either. what a cassette machine... He just knows that this happens. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the charming aspects of uh, here you are, a very great uh, mechanism on the piano, and yet... Any other mechanical ability except uh, perhaps uh, catching baseballs or whatever uh, is denied you. Am I right? You've obviously been either reading or writing my press releases. Uh -huh. It's absolutely true. You don't even like driving anymore. No, I can't stand driving. So you've hired a chauffeur? Well, <laughs> if, if only that were true. Actually, yes. I, have, it's, I depend, as they say, on the kindness of strangers to take me places. Well, however you get there, you do. And I know that you practice very well. I've always admired the way you use time. Well, I appreciate it. And actually, I, I use time better now than I ever have for various and sundry reasons. But uh, practicing is a, is a real art in itself, as you know. Uh, I know that you're very interested in how people practice. Uh, I can only tell you in a, in a very few sentences what I think. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do business. I'm saying this is my way of doing business. I believe one pr should practice as one plays. I do not believe in practicing with high fingers because you don't play with high fingers. And if you practice like that enough, the sound you produce when you do play will be bad in my view. Uh, I believe in practicing with, with musicality. I mm -hmm. do not believe in simply going over and over something without any sense of, of line or, or, or timing or whatever. I find the most difficult thing, obviously, I spend all my time on basically is simply timing and phrasing and sound and you know the basic things I I don't I'm not saying that everything that I do technically comes with ease that would be stupid I am saying that that the difficult thing though at at uh, levels um, when you begin obviously to mature hopefully I have and am and will uh, are these subtleties which which really are the important things it's the separation of the good from the significant performances i think mm -hmm. so i am I'm, I'm for practicing much as you play even if you practice slowly you should practice with a sense of musicality and mm, pedaling and all those things i mean you should take things out certainly and as john browning once said to me wash them oh that's wonderful wash them but oh. i i think that you should be careful that you haven't isolated things to the point that they you know, don't fit internally into the structure of the music or that you forget musically what you're doing. You know, I, I think that's, that's wisdom indeed about practicing so much is rigid and, you know... The... Well, I, I will say that Chopin said, I think that he didn't believe anyone should practice more than three hours a day. Um, I, I don't know how much you should practice. I mean, Gieseking had the best line of all. He, he said, well, somebody said, I understand, Mr. Gieseking, you only practice three hours a day. You think that's enough because so-and-so practices six hours a day. And he said, well, some people need to bathe more than others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. <laughs> I mean, if you could get it done, if I could get it done in a half an hour, I would appreciate doing that because oh. I don't like it. Yes. I mean, I, it's very, di practicing is very difficult. Well, you like to read. You like to, you know, listen like, to music. And I like to watch ball games. I mean, there are many things I like to do. And mm -hmm. practicing uh, is not uh, foremost on my list. I try to do it well because it's difficult. I understand. That's all I'm saying. So you're you're trying to make time work for you. Exactly. Stanley Waldorf is my guest today, and we've been listening from his discography. We're going to hear a most interesting work, the Elegy Number no. Four by Buzoni. Yeah, Turandot's Freund gemacht. It's the green sleeves of yes. fantasy uh, variations and and fantasy. The theme, uh, hmm. written by Henry the Eighth. Is that? I I don't know. I think it's anonymous, but. Uh, Buzoni himself thought it was Chinese, right? Yes, and he put it in his um, work called Turandot. But um, 
It's a wonderful elaboration and fantasy on green sleeves, and your performance of it is more than admirable, believe me. The artist Stanley Waldoff, The Fourth Elegy, by Ferruccio Buzzoni. <laughs> Fourth Elegy by Ferruccio Buzzoni in the hands of Stanley Waldoff. That is some work. Yes, very interesting and, and just a marvelous pianistic experience. We've been going through a small part of your discography of really over 30 composers, and most of these pieces are certainly not in the standard repertory. Do you still, Stan, enjoy Beethoven, sonatas, Mozart, concertos, or do you play any contemporary music? When they're played well, I enjoy it. When anything is played well, I enjoy it. And uh, yes, I mean, uh, for example, I mean, I, I love Schubert sonatas. I mean, they're, they're to die over. Mm -hmm. uh, I may not be able to play them as well as X, Y, or Z, so I you enjoy leave them alone. I leave them alone. I mean, the world doesn't need another great performance of the Schubert B-flat. They're there are enough of those. Uh, contemporary music, yes. I generally gravitate toward uh, contemporary music that, that comes out of the mold of the 19th century in the mm -hmm. sense that it's romantic or, mm -hmm. you know, accessible for me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not commenting on, on uh, prepared pianos and any of that. It, it may be perfectly wonderful, but as Rubenstein once said about Bartok, it's for another generation. Mm -hmm. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I do enjoy that. I enjoy the music of, of, of uh, Luigi Zaninelli, a composer in residence at, at the University of Southern Mississippi. And, 
and uh, I have recorded some of his music. Yes, you have. Um, Zaninelli is an excellent composer and understands the instrument very well. Well, we have very little time, and I would love to continue with at least one more piece. Let's try a work by Gottschalk. What is it? Uh, this is the Pasquinade of, of Louis Moreau Gottschalk, the world, or America's mm -hmm. first great concert pianist. He was an amazing man. Yeah, had an interesting death. Uh, died on stage uh, performing a piece called Morte. Death. Yes, he died at the age of 40, and you know that he gave about 5,000 concerts in the United States, and a part of every concert was given, he gave a, a, a sum to a different charity. Yes, he was, uh, he was an artist and a humanitarian. Well, this is a work that covers the keyboard exquisitely, and you'll listen to the top, which is magnificently recorded also, by the way. Um, uh, it is a work that maybe derives from a French gavotte. Yes, and it's absolutely rhythmically interesting, and, and Gottschalk was always a highly creative man. Let's, Chopin loved his music, and yes. so did others. Let's listen to Pasquinade by the American-born New Orleans, in fact, composer Louis Moreau Gottschalk. Stanley Waldorf, the pianist. <laughs>
Pasconade by Louis Moreau Gottschalk, the pianist, my guest today, Stanley Waldorf. Stan, thanks for coming. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, David. I've really enjoyed this very much. Wish you the best of luck. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening. <laughs>